Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Artur Oliveira. I'm in People Operations, and I'm very excited to welcome today James Nestor to Google to talk about his book, Deep, Free Diving, Renegade Science, and What the Ocean Tells Us About Ourselves. James is a journalist and free diver from San Francisco, and his book, really, it follows, the, it follows clans of extreme athletes, adventurers, and scientists who are transforming not only our knowledge of the planet and its creatures, but also our understanding of the human body and mind. Deep was released in July of 2014, and it's received a series of awards, including an Amazon Best Science Book of 2014, BBC Book of the Week, and a BuzzFeed Best Nonfiction Book of 2014. So uh, without further ado, if you could please help me welcome up James, and he'll give you a presentation. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right, we'll just get started. I think you forgot your phone. You're going to need that at some time. So a couple of years ago, I was sent by Outside Magazine to cover something called the World Freediving Championship. Now, this is a very weird competition where competitors challenge one another to see how deep they can dive on a single breath and come back to the surface conscious. So I had never free dived before, didn't know anything about it, didn't know anyone who had ever done this. So I was pretty confused when I went out to Greece, that's where the competition was held, and was sitting out on this boat the first day of the competition. It was about six miles off the coast of Kalamata, and uh, the visibility in the water was incredible, something like 200 feet. And I watched this free diver come out, and he started breathing really quickly, then he breathed really slowly, upturned his body, and dove. And he kept diving, and kept diving, and kept diving, until he completely disappeared. About four minutes later, I saw his tiny figure rematerialize in the water. He came up to the surface, took a breath, got out of the way for the next competitor. He just dove 330 feet on a single breath of air. So this completely blew my mind. I had no idea the human body was capable of diving to such depths for so long. So I remember that night, I went home uh, back to the hotel room, called my mom. She didn't know where in the world I was or what I was doing. I said, there's these people. They can dive 300 feet, and they can hold their breath for five minutes at a time. And she completely didn't believe me. Um, and she said, be sure to do your fact checking before you publish this, because these guys are obviously cheating in some way. There must be an air tank down there. But there wasn't an air tank down there. I did my fact checking. And uh, if there had been, and these guys had actually taken a hit of air from it, their lungs would have exploded as they ascended to the shallower depths. They would have died. Only the human body in its natural state can survive a fast 300-foot ascent. So I got back home to San Francisco, and I thought, wow, if I didn't know about the human body's amazing amphibious abilities to dive to such depths, what else don't I know about? What are the other secrets of the ocean, that human connection to the ocean? So I spent about two years researching this from the surface to the very bottom of the deepest sea. And that's what the book Deep is about. And I'm going to give you a little preview of just a few of the sections in it. So we are born of the ocean. Each of us has about a 98% similar chemical composition of blood um, to similar to seawater. Uh, the amniotic fluid in which a fetus develops is about 99% similar to seawater. So perhaps it's a coincidence, maybe not. Um, when we come out, we're born to free dive. A human infant, when placed in water, will reflexively open her eyes, she'll begin breaststroking, and she'll stay down there on her own terms for about 45 seconds at a time, arguably longer than most adults. We only lose this ability when we're taught how to walk, but gaining it is pretty easy. What I'm going to do now is to follow down a 300-foot dive by a French diver named Guillermi Neri. And I'm going to explain all of these mammalian dive reflexes that trigger in his body the deeper he goes. Uh, his body isn't really anything special. We all have these abilities. We're all born with these reflexes. And all we have to do is get in the water. They start triggering. Obviously, he's honed his to go to great depths. But anyone in reasonable health can dive down 50, 100, even 150 feet uh, on a single breath of air. So if you guys get bored, you can try to hold your breath as long as he is, because this is in real time. It's about four minutes, so you can start now. So the second he enters the water, something amazing happens. 
His heart rate's going to lower about 25% of his normal resting rate. Blood is going to start coursing from his extremities into his core. His mind's going to enter a very meditative state. Now, the deeper he goes, the more these reflexes are going to be triggered um, until he eventually reaches almost a comatose state in the water while he's still conscious. Right now, he's at around 35 feet. Just past this depth, he will enter into a negative buoyancy zone. So the ocean, instead of pulling him to the surface, it's going to start pulling him down to the seafloor. And he will keep dropping down until he reaches the very bottom. So you're going to see he's about to kick off right now. He's about to kick his legs a little bit. Um, he's not going to move his arms too much. He's just going to effortlessly fall down into the ocean. So every 33 feet he goes down, the air within his lungs is going to shrink in half. So by around 100 feet, the air in his lungs is going to be about the size of two fists. You can imagine how little air is going to be at 300 feet. So his body really kicks into overdrive now. His lungs will engorge with blood to stop themselves from caving in. His organ walls um, are also going to allow for the free flow of water and plasma to stop them from collapsing. His heart rate will lower even more. This will allow him to conserve more oxygen. Heart rates of free divers have been recorded as low as 14 beats per minute. Um, one free diver recorded a heart rate as low as seven beats per minute. So according to our understanding of the human body, this is totally impossible. A heart rate that low can't support consciousness. And yet deep in the ocean, it does. And no one knows how. So. The further he goes, his spleen is going to release new oxygenated blood into his bloodstream, which will, he'll use as sort of a turbo drive to go even further and stay down deeper. Uh, he's about to touch down now, the very bottom of the ocean. Um, again, this is supposed to be at around 300 feet, and this is when uh, it gets really difficult for him. He's got to make it back up against that pole of ocean, back to the surface conscious. But as you will soon see, Neri is very experienced. He's going to take his time. He's going to do a little air guitaring here for you. Uh, he knows to save around 60% of his oxygen reserves for the trip back up. So as he goes back up, all of those master switches within his body are going to begin reversing. His mind is going to wake up. Blood is going to push from his core back to his extremities. He's going to start resembling his human form again. When he's down this deep, he can either choose to swim up or to climb cliffs up. It doesn't matter because that's all of the water pushing against him. Free divers don't get the bends when they're diving under their own natural ability. The human body naturally knows how to purge all that nitrogen gas um, that has accumulated during the deep dive. And he's going to be purging that here in a second. He's going to come up, pause a little bit. It's been about three minutes and 50 seconds. I know some of you are still holding your breath. There he goes, and he's back at the surface, and he's going to try to do it even deeper next time. So those are the basics of the mammalian dive reflex. So competitive divers aren't the only ones that knew about this mammalian dive reflex. Cultures around the world have used it to harvest pearls, food, sponges, whatever, from the seafloor. And they've been doing it for literally tens of thousands of years. These are the Japanese ama divers who have been diving for around 3,000 years. Uh, when sailors went out to Japan and saw them, they reported that they were able to dive down around 150 feet. It's pretty good. And stay down there for 15 minutes at a time, which, of course, is totally impossible. And all the scientists who heard these stories in the 16th and 17th centuries called the sailors BS. They said, no, people can't do that. You guys were drunk. You got it all wrong. Uh, even up until the 1950s, scientists said the deepest a human could possibly dive and survive was around 100 feet, any deeper, and our lungs would collapse. Well, modern free divers are now diving down to 800 feet on a single breath of air. And the world record breath hold is about 12 minutes and 10 seconds. So just about two and a half minutes shy of these fabricated reports. And these guys haven't been doing this for this long. Uh, just about 20 years they've been competing. So if they keep going at this rate, 
They're going to dive deeper and deeper, hold their breath longer and longer. But the good news here is that free diving is much more than competition. Uh, when I was out there in Greece, I saw the ace divers make it down very deep, these incredible dives, 300, 350 feet, and come up just fine. But a lot of people didn't come up just fine. They came up unconscious. They came up with bloody noses. One guy was technically dead for about two minutes before he was resuscitated. It was the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life. And it was also kind of sad and frustrating that they had honed this incredible ability to dive deep and were just using it for most of them, just for bragging rights. Say, hey, I can dive deeper than you. Hey, I'll, you know, I'll challenge you to see how long I can hold my breath. But luckily when I was out there, I met some much more philosophical freedivers who use freediving as kind of a meditation, like an underwater yoga. They never got hurt, they never resurfaced with bloody faces, and they never uh, you know, came close to dying. They respected their limits and used this as a way of exploring the ocean environment and their own amphibious abilities. And they also started using it for scientific research, and that's what I'm gonna talk about next here. Because something else amazing happens when you free dive in the ocean without scuba tanks, without a boat, without a submarine, is instead of animals swimming away from you, as they do when you have a scuba tank, if anyone's scuba dived here, uh, they turn around and they swim towards you. They envelop you in their shoals and schools and pods, and they will stay there for hours. They get really curious. They don't look at you as prey either. The prey doesn't go down and look them in the eye and hang out. They look at you very curiously and uh, we'll see in a little bit dolphins and whales start sending their communication whistles and clicks to you because they think they can contact you. So it was with this group that I was able to spend about 18 months. Um, they showed me how to free dive with whales and dolphins. They showed me this completely other side of this activity, which was about the furthest thing away from the competitive side, as you can imagine. One of the most interesting things I thought that they were working on was echolocation and click communication with cetaceans, which are dolphins and whales. Now, let's start a little animation here. Um, eyes aren't much good in the ocean. Uh, half the time, it's completely black because it's nighttime, and past around 1,500 feet, it's completely black because uh, light can't get down there. So what whales and dolphins have done is they've developed different senses. We also have these senses. I'll show you that in just a minute. A whale can echolocate. What they do is they send out a click, and they wait for the echo of that click to return. And they take that data, and they form a picture of everything around them. It's basically a form of sonar. And with this echolocation, they can see better than we can see with our eyes. They can see a human from a mile deep. And a dolphin can see a rice grain from around 300 feet away just with echolocation by clicking and waiting for the return of that click to come back to them under their jaws. They don't receive it with their ears. They receive it underneath their jaws, which has the equivalent of around 10,000 little ears in it. So this goes on for a while. We don't need to see that. So, Humans aren't that good at echolocation, but we're pretty good. This guy is Brian Bushway. He is completely blind. He lost his optic nerves when he was 14 years old. But he's taught himself to click just like whales and just like dolphins and use those clicks to form a picture in his mind. He lives a completely independent life. He can ride his bike down busy city streets. He camps alone in the woods. He travels alone to different countries just by clicking, waiting for the echoes of those clicks to come back. When some researchers in Canada took him and some other human echolocators and put them in an fMRI, they had them echolocate and they looked at their brain. They found that the visual cortex of their brains lit up. So um, to them, there was basically no difference from what they were seeing with the frequency of sound to what you and I see with the frequencies of light. Different frequency, different sense, same end result. So humans, pretty good at echolocation. Um, again, not nearly as good as the sperm whale. The clicks this animal makes to use in its form of sonar can be heard hundreds of miles away. 
Um, some researchers believe they can be heard on the other side of the planet and they can keep in contact with one another that way. Um, the clicks are so loud that when you're diving with them, they can not only blow out your ears, but they could also vibrate your body to death. So, what do free diving researchers do? Well, of course, they dive with them. Um, what I'm going to show you is some footage from Mauritius. This was taken about two years ago. And these are some free divers who are recording these clicks up close. They're the only people that really have access to these animals. You can't do this with scuba, with a rebreather, or on a boat. So it's a very unique opportunity to look at their behavior and correlate behavior with the clicks. So um, what's going to be happening here is there's this little calf who is going to be very curious about the cameraman. And I'm just going to kind of let you watch this and check it out. These clicks, again, are so loud um, and so powerful, you actually feel them in your body. And your body starts heating up after a while. It's like a CT scan. So without further ado, let's so all of these clicks, um, these aren't coming from a boat. These are coming from the whales. And this guy's going to get a really good look at this cameraman. So again, he's collecting all of the echoes of that click with his lower jaw, and you can watch him flip around and start clicking more to get a really good look at this guy. So these whales stayed with those free divers for about four hours till the free divers had to get out of the water. They were just too exhausted. Um, so the next question I know you're all wondering is why the hell would anyone want to do this? Why would you want to free dive with the largest predator on the planet, an animal that has eight inch long teeth that usually it eats 60 foot long squid? You could see this guy could like so easily fit into his mouth and be munched uh, without the whale ever knowing. Well, again, the only way to study sperm whales and dolphins up close and really record their click communication is by free diving. Free diving is completely silent, it's non-invasive, the animals welcome you into their pods. And what they've been finding out, they actually found this out a couple dec decades ago, but now they're, they're finding out more information about it, is those clicks you just heard aren't just used for echolocation, they're also used for communication. This is what a sperm whale click, this is very pixelated, it didn't look a lot better on my computer, but this is what it looks like on a spectrogram, which is a visual readout of an audio signal. So each of these clicks are one second long, and inside of these clicks are millisecond long clicks, and inside of those clicks are microsecond long clicks. You can open this up and it just gets more and more detailed as far as you want to go. Now sperm whales can replicate those clicks to the exact microsecond over and over and over again in perfectly synchronized patterns. And then they can change small little bits, millisecond long clicks within those and replicate those patterns over and over and over again. So this isn't a random signal. It's not a dog barking. They're doing this deliberately, but we still don't know exactly why. Many researchers believe that it's a form of communication. But the communication isn't tonal, like a human language, but a digital form of communication, some, something similar to a fax machine transmission, which works the exact same way, by sending very distinct tones, millisecond long tones, through a phone line. These are some more cetacean vocalizations. So I know that sounds insane to many of you. Sperm whales, of course, 
don't have a sophisticated form of communication. They can't exchange information the way you and I can. Um, and it probably should, but just consider a few things first. These are two sperm whales head on. This is what it looks like when they approach you to welcome you into their pods. And I've had this experience, and it really makes you doubt what you're doing down there for the first few minutes until they, they kind of soften up. But right, that big bulbous thing on top, that's where their brain is. Now that brain is about six times the size of yours. Sperm whales have had this size brain for around 30 to 40 million years. We've had our current size brain about 200,000 years. So in the scope of brain evolution, that's a long time. Sperm whales have a neocortex, which in humans governs things like reasoning, language. Their neocortex is six times the size of ours. They also have spindle cells. These are very highly developed brain structures that neurologists have associated with intuition, love, suffering, and again, language. All those things that make humans human. So they not only have spindle cells, they have them in a far larger profusion than you and I do. And they've had them for 15 million years longer than we have. So animals don't grow a huge brain randomly. A brain takes up a lot of energy, takes up about 20% of your oxygen. They, they're using this brain for something. Um, what are they doing when they orient themselves like this <laughs> and send clicks to one another over and over again? They do this around free divers too. At the beginning, they echolocate you and then they start sending these communication clicks as they orient themselves like this. It's one of the weirdest things anyone can ever experience. So those are just a few of the things these researchers are trying to figure out right now. They're working with a group of mathematicians and physicists in France trying to bust this cetacean click communication code. Um, they believe it's not a linguistics problem, but a coding problem. And the way to solve it isn't going to be by approaching it through uh, more academic means, but to involve some coders and some people really into data transmission who understand that to try to figure out what these animals are saying. And that's hopefully what they're going to be doing in the next couple of years. We know they're talking. We know they're talking to one another. Uh, we just don't know what they're saying yet. And hopefully we're going to figure that out. So in a nutshell, very brief nutshell, that's just part of the uh, research that I did for the book Deep here. And um, the research is ongoing. These guys that I was just profiling now uh, got some funding to do more expeditions. They've collected more uh, behavioral and communication data on sperm whales in a few years of free diving with them than anyone in history has done through um, institutional means. So whatever they're doing is working. Hopefully, we'll be able to um, produce some real results in the next few years. So um, I guess we'll do some uh, questions now. If anyone happens to have any, I'll, I'll play some of this in the background. Um, just a little eye candy of what it's like to dive with sperm whales. Oh, no questions. I answered all of them. Yes? Um, how do you know they're not as intelligent and sophisticated in their communications with each other as? Oh, I believe that. My, my personal subjective opinion, I believe their, their communication is way more sophisticated than ours. Ours, human communication is very prone to errors. A tonal communication, you pronounce something slightly wrong, you can't understand it. A digital form of communication is, is very precise. So everything about their brain size, the complexity and evolution of their brains. Um, you talk to any neuroscientist that looks at this brain, they say, absolutely, this is an extremely intelligent animal. Um, we just haven't been able to study them because you can't put this thing in a lab. You can't study it in the wild until now. I mean, now they can study them up close. And like I said, they're getting more information on them now than, than they ever have before. Uh, so it's really exciting. I think that we're, we're at a really neat position right now where technology is cheap, it's readily available, and we now have access to these animals to really do some, um, to collect some great data on them. And I think that something's going to happen, uh, some, something significant is going to happen. So yeah, just subjectively, I'm absolutely certain they're, they're intelligent. Once you dive with them, uh, that, that becomes apparent pretty soon. Yes, sir. So beyond um, maternal bonding, which is, I think, pretty common in cetaceans, 
do you see any is there any evidence when you dive with them of any other emotional types of responses you know do you see any any um uh, what we would associate with human behaviors like uh, annoyance or affection or uh bonding beyond maternal bonding that kind of behavior do do particular whales bond with particular divers Are you seeing any evidence of of emotional content on the part of the uh team? for sure they uh sperm whales share um uh, uh, more cultural similarities to humans than any other animal on the planet. They grow up with a matriarchal society uh, with their mothers and their aunts and their grandmothers as the males when they become teenagers form little gangs and go out and cause trouble around then they come back around the equator uh, every summer to hang out. So um, as far as diving with them I've had limited experience I've done it a few times they've have literally you know 40 50 solid days of experience doing this and what usually happens is the calf can't hold its breath for too long so the mom goes down and gets food checks everyone out cruises around, echolocates everyone to make sure we're not a threat, goes down and gets food and leaves the calf to play with us. So then it comes back and hangs out. Um, this guy right here, Fred Buell, one, um, one of the world's foremost free divers, uh, actually saw a sperm whale uh, give birth to, uh, to a calf, which is extremely rare. And he has this all on video. All of the other whales in the pod circled it and imprinted it with its name through echolocation. Um, so really intense stuff. Again, we don't know exactly what those clicks are, but hopefully they're going to find out pretty soon. Um, I'm curious as to why you think that uh, free diving is a better way of getting at this than a rebreather. Uh, because I, I saw this firsthand out in Sri Lanka, uh, that's where we did some of this research. We had to hop on these little panga boats, uh, really sketchy situation. They were almost um, drowning us every day. But um, what happened is you have to be ready uh, within a second to dive with the whales. You can't just cruise. You never put yourself onto them because they can just dive and go away. You have to park the boat, turn off the motor, and get in the water and hang out and 99.9% .9 of the time they swim away. So it's only when they choose to come to you that these encounters happen. You can never put yourself on them. One of the photographers had a rebreather and it was, it was quite hilarious because every time when it was on, when the whales would approach, suddenly they'd come up from the very deep waters, uh, we would get in the water. He'd be sitting there messing with his rebreather, trying to get it in. By, by the time we were done, he'd get in the water and wouldn't get anything. Uh, also, rebreathers make noise. Um, they're much more quiet than scuba, but, but there is some exhale of bubbles. Um, they're extremely technical, too. So if you don't have them just right, uh, you're in big trouble. So the, the guy who had the rebreather actually just left it at the hotel room the next few days and learned how to free dive. So. How long will he stay down? Uh, the free diver? Uh -huh. um, it, it really depends. You know, you, you train to do this so you can stay down maybe three minutes or so. But um, all that training went out the window for me when you've got this 60-foot animal the size of a school bus approaching you and my heart rate was just... I couldn't stay down very, very deep. But luckily, they didn't care. They were fine with me hanging out at the surface. And I did some, some small dives and then got more comfortable, and they got more comfortable. You know, they have to go up for air, too, and come down. So they, when, when they see you doing it, they get really, really interested when you're doing the same thing that they're doing. And that's why I think they allow us to hang around for so long. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the training to become a free diver and, and like especially about the early stages, how you start developing that skill? Yeah, um, well, my entree into this world was through the competition. So the last thing I wanted to do after that competition was to become a free diver. Uh, it just looked absolutely nuts and um, still have some of those horrible visions in my head. So it was a psychological issue for me. I knew my body could stay underwater for around four minutes, like every, just like everyone else. But um, psychologically, I just kept having those visions of those guys who didn't make it up to the surface. So um, just slowly, I started hanging out with the people that understood it as more of a meditation, as a yoga practice, and was able to get those visions out of my mind and you know get these in there. And um, that made it a lot easier. So specifically, to answer your question, there's a number of breath hold tables you can do. 
Do a very deep breaths for two minutes, hold for two minutes. Deep breaths for two minutes, hold for two and a half minutes, like interval training. Um, and that's how a lot of free divers do it. And that's what I do on really boring flights to try to keep myself in, in shape to do this. But you, you'd be amazing. Uh, I mean, you'd be amazed. Like, you take about two hours of instruction and this stuff just immediately turns on. And something I just want to mention again, I, I think it gets dangerous when you do it competitively. Competitors don't think so, but I've, I've seen it otherwise. Uh, if you accept this as a natural thing when you need to breathe, go up and breathe. You know, if you don't feel like diving deep, don't dive deep. Um, you know, the AMA have been diving for 3,000 years. There's no record of them ever blacking out or ever, ever, ever having a problem because they listen to their bodies. So I think that's the most important thing. I've heard a story uh, of a German businessman who was sailing out in the ocean and he, and he said that he had this dream that he needed to sail to the Azores. And uh, he told everyone, we're going to the Azores. And they sold to, sailed to the Azor, toward the Azores and they came across a white sperm whale. And then they follow the white sperm whale um, all the way to a pod. Like he's, he was like asking them to come to his family. And they sailed all the way to the family of sperm whales and they spent all day um, swimming with them. And he said because of that, it led him to start a whole project uh, across the Pacific, building these sort of traditional sailing vacas. And there was this whole film that's being made on it. And I wonder, have you heard anyone describe stories like that or, or interacted with traditional peoples and their beliefs you know, as, you're, you know, as you've been out with the sperm whales and, and the free divers who have been studying them? The only story I've heard with a white sperm whale, I read this book in college. I forget the name of it, but, uh, but I I've actually haven't heard that, um, that story. But I know that this is something that's growing right now, and some free divers are concerned about it, that a bunch of tourists are going to go out and, and try to dive with these whales. But I'm not concerned about it, because the whales can leave at any, they choose. So they'll choose whether or not they want to dive with people. I think it's much more disruptive to them to cruise around with 300 people on a boat and circle them and hope to get a, a picture of them. I, you know, when you cut a motor and just go out in the water and, and wait there for them to come to you, it's a, it's a different thing. But I think, um, you know, again, with all GoPro technologies, there's, there's so many YouTube videos of people having these encounters with sperm whales. And I mean, once you have one, you're, you're kind of forever screwed. Uh, I mean, it's all you want to do. It's all you can uh, think about. And uh, it's a pretty powerful experience. So I think the more people that do it, the better. Uh, you know, word gets out. Well, James, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, that was a lovely presentation. I think we all certainly learned a lot. Right. Thanks thank a you. lot. Okay. <laughs>